Science! Welcome to another Halloween science episode. This time, we will be unlocking the mystery, the origin, and maybe even the science behind those undead bloodsuckers. Vampires. As always, if you dig this video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and check out our full Halloween science playlist for more. From early depictions in folklore to sliding into your nightmares, the undead creature known as the vampire seems to have been around for centuries. Now, while a lot of the traits associated with them can be traced back into antiquity, the term vampire actually was only popularized in Western Europe in the 18th century. And thanks to pop culture today, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know what a vampire is and most of the important traits that are associated with them. The biggest one, of course, is that vampires feed on the vital essence of another being by literally draining their blood. The second most famous trait is that vampires are largely considered to be undead. Both of these traits are present in stories and folklore from ancient times, like the monsters depicted on pottery shards from ancient Persia, strange creatures attempting to drink the blood of men. In ancient Greece, there were a few characters that exhibited vampire-like qualities, like Empusa, the daughter of the goddess Hecate, who apparently would turn into a beautiful woman to seduce men and then drink their blood. On the side of undead creatures, there were many stories of revenants, from Old Irish Celtic and Norse mythology, referred to as draugers, to documented cases by English historians in the Middle Ages. These stories tell of people being buried and then roaming the earth days later, sometimes just to visit loved ones, and other times rising from the dead to kill. During the so-called Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, the belief in many folklore and legends was ended. Yet the belief in vampires actually increased to almost mass hysteria levels throughout most of Europe. The first officially recorded vampiric encounters involved two corpses coming back to life in Serbia, Peter Blagojevic and Arnold Paol. In Peter's case, he died in 1725, and within eight days of his demise, nine other people perished. On their deathbeds, they claimed to have been beaten by an undead Peter at night. So, the townsfolk got the local priest involved, and they dug up the body, and accounts described the body undecomposed, with new hair, skin, and nails and drops of blood around his mouth. So they drove a wooden stake through the corpse, and fresh blood flowed from the wound and the face. So they burned the body to be sure that they had killed the monster. I mean, that's freaking crazy. In fact, this was the time when many bodies were dug up across Europe after being suspected of being a vampire. And then they would be subsequently staked through the heart it wasn't until the 19th century that many of the modern beliefs about vampires started to find their way into widely accepted descriptions of the monsters. For example, Bram Stoker's Dracula, first published in 1897, cemented the idea that vampires were charismatic, and also that they had fangs to help them drain their victims of blood. In 1922, the silent film Nosferatu brought the idea that vampires were afraid of and even could be harmed by sunlight. But what of the vampire, if anything, resides in science? Can we draw any scientific conclusions onto the true origins of these undead beings? Well, in fact, it might have been the lack of understanding of science that led to many of these early encounters with what was thought to be vampires. First of all, the idea of coming back from the dead and subsequently drinking someone's life force in the hopes that you prolong your life are very common psychodynamic theories. In 1931, the Welsh psychoanalyst Ernest Jones wrote On the Nightmare and laid out some of these core ideas. Basically speaking, we all have the desire to reunite with our loved ones that have passed away. Jones talks about how emotions such as love, guilt, hate, and fear all fuel the idea of returning from the grave. This can also explain why in many early stories, those that did rise from the dead went and visited their relatives first. 
People that identify with immortal vampires in such a way helps them to overcome or even escape from the innate fear of dying that everyone has. The sheer idea that a person could come back from the dead actually stems from the lack of knowledge surrounding what really happens to a body when it decomposes. During that mass hysteria about vampires that ran rampant in Europe, many bodies that were suspected of being vampires were dug up to see if there was any evidence to support the claims. We now know rates of decomposition vary depending on things like temperature, soil composition, and even the cause of death. So when a dead body was found to not decompose to the rate that people believed it should have, this was thought of as proof that that person was a vampire. We also know now that a corpse will swell with gas, making the body appear plump, and in a way that the people might have described it back then, well fed in death. Also, these gases will put out increased pressure on the body and force blood out from the nose and the mouth, a common piece of evidence documented by vampire hunters exhuming bodies at that time. Remember when I said they were driving a stake through these corpses in the hopes of stopping the vampires they had discovered? Well, it just so happens that if you were to puncture a corpse, especially a more recent one, it would bleed and therefore seem like you had killed it again. Really creepy stuff. Another theory on the dead rising from the grave? Being buried alive. This is a common fear in many people, and it unfortunately did happen a few times in antiquity, with bodies being later exhumed to only see them in a state of stress and fingernail claw marks on the lids of their coffins. Rabies could also explain some of the tropes associated with vampires. This disease has been around since at least 2000 BC, but it wasn't until Louis Pasteur figured out a treatment for it in the 1880s that it was actually better understood. Hypersensitivity and susceptibility to garlic and light are symptoms of rabies, and the disease can even affect the part of your brain that controls your normal sleep patterns, making the person nocturnal. It is also of note that wolves and bats, both associated with vampires, are primary carriers of rabies. Speaking of animals, there are a few examples that can lend themselves to the myth of the vampire. The Strix was a nocturnal bird that was usually a bad omen if you saw it, and apparently fed on the blood of humans in ancient Greek myth. While that animal lies firmly in myth, the vampire bat is an actual real thing. Again, thanks to Dracula, vampire bats are mentioned twice in the story, and Dracula himself transforms into one. The vampire bat does feed on blood, mainly of cattle, and it has been known to attack humans, but because of their small size, they can't really inflict too much damage. Still, this is the best case for a real world scenario involving a real vampire. But even with science explaining many of the traits of vampires away, there are still some unexplained and mysterious cases involving what many believe to be actual vampires. One of the most famous involves August Delagrange from 1912 in Louisiana. As the story goes, five bodies were found dismembered in their homes after they were reported missing. Now the dismembered body parts were gruesome but the strange thing was that the crime scenes all had a noticeable lack of blood. The local people around the bayou all thought this evidence pointed towards a vampire, and the local authorities were baffled as more grisly murders kept popping up. So a Catholic priest, Father Henry Jante, was called in to investigate, and he brought along his longtime acquaintance, Moses Amashan, a voodoo priest. As their account goes, the unlikely pair of holy men traveled around the local town in search of the vampire, and apparently even killed a few of his minions. Jante and Amajan found out that the apparent master vampire was none other than a man named August Delagrange, and he was seen at a local train station with, quote, ghostly pale skin and with blood on his shirt. Father Jante tracked down Delagrange to his isolated shack deep in the swamps 
and found the supposed head vampire lying in his bed. The priest then drove a wooden stake through his heart, and Delagrange apparently made no sound, but quote, only opened his eyes wide and looked into the face of his killer before fading into hell. After Delagrange's death, the murder stopped, and the local population believed the master vampire had been killed. Whether or not the accounts of him being a vampire were true, he was most likely the serial killer plaguing the nearby towns. Delagrange's skeleton is on display to this day at the Vampire Museum in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Vampires have made their way into every facet of popular culture over the last century, from films and television shows, novels, short stories and songs, and even as a beloved character on Sesame Street. The idea of the undead evil being draining the life force from the living victims has been around for a very long time, and it doesn't look like the myth, or possibly the reality, of the vampire will die off anytime soon. Once again, if you liked this episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube and check out our Halloween science playlist for more exciting episodes.